Welcome to In Edina, a program about the people, places, and activities in the city of Edina. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald, and it is a pleasure to bring you this broadcast from the Centennial Lakes Amphitheater and Park area. Thank you so much, Tom Shirley, our first guest, park manager. It is so great to be able to broadcast from this beautiful place. Well, thanks for coming out to the park. We really appreciate it, and we want to hear all about it for those that maybe have lived here a long time or those new to the city. This is a gold mine out here. Sure, it's been very popular. A lot of people come here every day. And it didn't start out looking like this. No, for over 40 years this was the Hedberg gravel pit site. And then back in the late 80s, the city worked with a lot of great partners to convert it over to the Centennial Lakes Park that you see today. And, and what's interesting is, is it's an urban area. So you have residential landscaped areas here as well as businesses and entertainment sites. Talk a little bit about that. Well, sure. The uh, idea was for people to be able to live, work, play, and shop all in one area. And it's been very successful. Uh, it's been carried over now throughout the country. So it's been a, a real model for other uh, communities. And, and it's not only just a place you can walk around, but you can actually be very active. And we want to talk about many of the different activities. But let's start with just sort of the landscaping of this area. As you take a look at it, you're working with the DNA are and you're bringing in annuals every year. Tell, tell us a little bit about that. Well sure, Centennial Lakes is known for its landscaping. Uh, we have about 14 acres of landscape grounds and uh, we've got a great horticulturist that takes care of them. Every year we uh, supplement our perennials with about 5,000 annuals uh, just to make it look real nice and a lot of color, things like that. And uh, it's just a great place for people to go and walk around. Uh, a lot different than your your normal hiking or walking trails. How much of a walking trail do you have here in this area? Well we have one and a half miles of hiking trails right around the lake here. Okay and you actually work with the DNR to stock fish in these ponds. Sure the uh, DNR right now stocks bluegills, uh, largemouth bass as well as northern pike and people can come down here and fish uh, anytime they like. We also have a program called Fishing in the Neighborhood with the DNR where kids can come out and learn how to fish and uh, that's been very popular now for about the last four or five years. So that's a great program with the Department of Natural Resources and pretty popular with the kids this year for fishing. Three times a year you're having it yes. and it's a sign up in advance kind of a thing but environmentally having the fish here is also a good thing. Yeah, it uh, helps control the lake balance a little both in terms of the smaller fish as well as the water quality and provides a great amenity because people can come down here and fish and catch something all the time. So. In the city of Edina, who knew yeah. you could go fishing? I got a northern this big right yeah. there in the city of Edina <laughs> in the park. Let's talk about paddle boats and the gondola and lawn bowling, croquet. I mean, there are tons of things to do here. Sure, there really is. We've got, uh, we'll start with the lake, the paddle boats. We've got a little fleet of paddle boats where people can go out and get a new perspective on the park, paddle around the lakes, feed the ducks, and just kind of enjoy the day out there. And uh, they can also, as I mentioned, they can fish from the shoreline, and that's great. We've got the Dyna Model Yacht Club that's also based out of uh, the park here, and they're using radio-controlled boats to uh, by the park's waterways, and that's been a lot of fun. People can either watch them or they're happy to let well, people join in. Wow, so, so if you're, you have to be a member of that club to, to, to dip in if you've got a motorized boat, or how does that work? Uh, no, you don't have to be a member, but uh, it's not a bad idea because uh, they're a great resource for people. Okay, great. And, and now what about the uh, gondola and uh, the lawn bowling and croquet? Well, sure, we have Gondola Romantica here in the park for the second year and they give rides on the park waterways uh, every evening and so people can get in an authentic Venetian gondola and uh, tour the entire park and that's been a lot of fun. It sounds absolutely romantic oh, actually really to is. tour on a nice calm water, a nice evening out after dinner, oh. beautiful. Yeah, nice lighting in the park, it really the adds moon. to it. I bet it is absolutely beautiful. Yeah, we also have the croquet as you mentioned and lawn bowling. Uh, we've got some of the only public croquet and lawn bowling courts in the Midwest 
and so people are come, able to come down and enjoy those and uh, we're happy to teach them the game if they're not uh, familiar with that. And we also have a lot of people that are here a lot that are more than happy to uh, help out if uh, they need some help. Yeah, that's great. I understand the state tournament for croquet is actually held here. Yeah, it is. The <laughs> state uh, tournament in both croquet and lawn bowling. Wow. Yeah, every September they have that, and it's a lot of fun. That's absolutely beautiful. Now, the amphitheater, which is where we are right now, is a, a beautiful place for concerts. Tell us about the seating area and the types of programs we might see here. Well, sure. We do about 80 uh, different events in our amphitheater every summer. Uh, primarily community band concerts. We'll have jazz concerts, though, a little bit of uh, community theater, things such as that. And the high schools will come out here and perform as well. Yeah, some of the high schools will come out here and do, do some fun little uh, activities, so that's kind of nice. Um, we seat a thousand people here, so uh, there's plenty of room. And we do some larger events that uh, have been real popular, like Lighthouse Night as well as uh, our John Phillips, John Phillips uh, Sousa, Sousa Band. Band. Yeah. yeah, that's absolutely uh, wonderful and magnificent. And the acoustics here are awesome. Uh, you know, you have the outdoor atmosphere. I mean, I love outdoor concerts. Sure. It's just a whole different feel and a whole different setup and a real family organized event. Yeah, it really is. It's just a great place to watch a concert in the evening. It's also a great place to get married with a view like this. And uh, as we mentioned, there's a pretty popular place for that. Yeah, we have about 60 weddings in our amphitheater every year, uh, sometimes as many as three a day, so it can get a little hectic around here. <laughs> three a day. Okay, this couple in, this couple out. Well, you are really busy. Exactly. That's great. High school uh, prom pictures, senior pictures, or just take family pictures for a beautiful backdrop. You can't miss it. Yeah, exactly. You're very fortunate to be here, and we're fortunate to have this wonderful asset, um, but it's also a year-round activity, right? Yes, it is. Uh, most activities are in the summertime, but in the, the spring as well as the fall, people can come out and just enjoy the park, uh, use the walking trails, jog, things like that. And then in the wintertime, we become a skating rink. So all 10 acres of our lake here are groomed daily, and people can skate all of that, all uh, the area there. We have uh, skate rentals, we have sled rentals, uh, nice crackling fireplaces for people, as well as concessions, restrooms, things like that. Well, we're very fortunate to have this, and I really appreciate you coming to tell us about the, the summer and let us uh, have this broadcast here, and uh, we'll see you out in the park, no doubt. Well, thank you. Tom Shirley, thanks for joining us on In a Dine. I'm thanks. very grateful. Well, of course, there are many things to do here at Centennial Lakes Park, but one activity in particular is very special and historic. And joining us to talk about the Twin Cities Croquet Club is our very own croquet pro, Nate Weimerskirch. Thanks very much for joining us. Nice to be here, Lillian. Really appreciate it. And there are two croquet pros from the city of Edina in the country in the top 50. Is that right? There are two top-ranked players in the country that are members of the Twin Cities Croquet Club, myself and Rick Sheely, a doctor here in Edina. Um, the two of us have gone around the country and played in some top level tournaments, including national championships. Yeah, this is such an endearing game, for me in particular, because my grandfather, who's from England, tried to teach us this game in the backyard, and that's where you learn to play too, and most people are learning to play this game in the backyard. Almost everybody has a familiarity with the sport in the backyard version, and, and what we do is very similar to that game. But, of course, it, it's very different in, in the sense that to get to the professional level, you're practicing a lot. There are how many members on, on the club here? We have 15 members in the club currently. Um, we had eight a couple of years ago, so we're growing pretty quickly, and we'd like to get some more members. And all ages apply? We have members uh, that are in their 20s. We have members in their 80s. It's a sport for just about everybody. Don't need to have any special skills. Doesn't require a lot of strength. Um, requires uh, a little bit of strategic thinking and uh, a lot of accuracy. And I think a lot of patience, too, I would imagine. And it's, uh, it's beautiful, too, because my game suffers because it was on you know, the backyard lawn. But this is on bent grass, so it's beautiful. Our game is a very precise game, yeah. We play on a court that could be used as a lawn tennis court or a golf green. Um, and yeah, it gives you a lot, lot better chance for making very precise shots. Now for those that don't know much about the game, the size of the court is about the size of a tennis court. If you enclose in a tennis court, it's about the tennis court plus the, the extra area you need around the side of it. And the uh, object of the game is to, of course, hit the ball and you have to get it through wickets. Right, so similar to what people have seen in the backyard, that you try to get your ball through a series of shots, through a series of wickets, 
to the stake at the end in order to win. And it's a race kind of a game, and it's singles and doubles, right? Right. So difference from the backyard game, the backyard game is usually more a political game. You got six people all playing six different balls, and it's gang up on the leader or whatever. We play a pure game. It's one team against another, um, always four balls in the game. So in essence, it's always a doubles game. Um, two against two. And so the cooperation aspect of it is a very important part of the game. Now here at Centennial Lakes, the equipment is provided for the most part. I mean, you don't have to buy a lot of fancy gear out here. The wickets are provided, the balls are provided, the area and the space and the grass is well groomed, of course. But you do want to supply your own mallet. And, and that's kind of a changing part of the game. You, you brought a mallet to show off for us today. And uh, what's interesting is this looks like wood, but it really isn't wood. Our game is changing with the technology just like golf is, that this is actually a um, fairly high-tech plastic that won't wear out. Um, we're going to graphite and carbon fiber and aluminum shafts and all that sort of thing is starting to, to come into the game because players want to be as precise as they can. Well, and it's fairly competitive, so uh, you can't blame them, but really the mallet is the only thing anybody needs to, to bring with them when they come to play. You practice three times a week, right? Uh, our club meets three times a week, Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Saturdays. Tuesday, Thursday evenings. Uh, Thursday evening is the night that our beginners come out and play, so it would be a wonderful time for people to come down and see what the sport's all about. And then Saturday mornings, just show up and uh, enjoy it. And you have a big state championship. You have two major events a year, but the biggest one coming up is in September, and that's the state tournament. Tell us a little bit about that. Uh, our club and the other players in Minnesota, there's a club up at, uh, in Brainerd, Minnesota, um, get together for a state championship every year. Um, it is the best players in the state and uh, we'll play uh, the second week of September, uh, Tuesday, Thursday, Saturday. And, right here. Uh, right here at Centennial Lakes. So folks will be able to watch the game and, and uh, take a look at it and maybe even get involved. That's correct. Twin Cities Croquet Club right here, Centennial Lakes Park. Thank you very much, Nate. Congratulations on your pro status and good luck at the tournament. Thank you very much. Appreciate you being here. From dry land activities to a nice hot spot right here, in the pond at Centennial Lakes. Gondola Romantica is a beautiful cruise you can take any summer evening. And joining us to talk about the cruises, Casey Clayton, gondolier driver. You absolutely enjoy this work. I can tell from your passion when you talk about it. Thanks a lot for joining us. Thank you for letting me be here. We really appreciate it. Now tell us a little bit about the gondola historically. Well, it's the gondolas have evolved over a thousand years of history. Um, they originally started with cargo and carrying it in very shallow waters and still being able to control the boat whereas during the Renaissance they evolved more to escort the aristocracy and upper class around so every family would have their own personal gondolier but then after all the industrial and political revolutions they became more of a tourist attraction and in which case we they took on the British sailing uniform, which is what I'm wearing right now, and have to this day. Beautiful. And of course, it's still a popular tourist attraction. Oh, yeah. And you get lots of folks that want to come and, and take a ride in the gondola. Tell us a little bit about a gondola. Well, uh, the one we have is uh, 36 feet. It's about 1,200 pounds. And we can carry up to six adults. And we give we give rides here at Centennial Lakes and also in Stillwater right on the St. Croix. And, and the oar, you're the only driver and, and you basically are taking care of the gondola and your customers. And, and how long is the oar? It's a 14 foot oar and then we power it by putting the oar in an oar lock called a forcula and we use our weight shift to power the boat. And it's, it's got to be beautifully quiet right oh, out here. It's one of my favorite places to row. You, you've got a nice sunlit evening or a, a moonlit evening. Oh yes, M moonlight rides are fantastic. I bet they are. Yeah. And, and the gondola is, is, is so romantic too. I mean, from Venice. Yep. And you probably take a lot of customers out here who are out just wanting a quiet evening. That's right. And you've got some special moments too that you've been a part of. Yeah, we do, we do like uh, anniversaries and wedding proposals and occasionally we'll do a wedding 
and it's just great to be a part of all those special moments in people's lives, even if it's just for like a short ride, 25 minutes or 45 minutes, and just a great opportunity to you know, really see the best parts of you know, relationships and romance. And you, one and, night you had two proposals in one night. Yeah, that was, that was a really fun evening. <laughs> you get the nervous uh, groom-to-be or, or the bride and... Yeah, it's, it's really great to just see people's reactions when, you know, in certain situations, which usually, you know, occasionally you'll see it, but for the most part you just see it in the movies or something. And yeah, so here it is, real live and in person on Centennial Lakes, and you're a part of it. And you cater to the customer. If they want to talk about the gondola, you talk to them about it. Yep. If they want to just talk among themselves or just enjoy a quiet ride, you'll take care of that as well. Yep, and That's wonderful. both I enjoy, so. Good. Now, tell us a little bit about the rides. You can go every day of the week? Seven days a week. Uh, we'll reserve from 4 to midnight. Um, we do 25-minute rides and 45-minute rides, okay. which go for either $50 for the 25 minutes or $95 for the 45 minutes. It doesn't matter how many passengers you have. Um, that, that rates for two people, and then if there's additional people, um, it'll cost a little more. Okay, what kind of training do you have to, to, to ride a gondola like this? Um, well, I, I studied with my, with my boss, the owner of the business. Um, and that's who, John Kirschbaum? Yep, John Kirschbaum. And when he started the business, he went over to Venice and learned how to row, um, bought a boat and brought it back here, and started the business in Stillwater six years ago. Wow. And then just last summer is when I started training under him and learned how to row. And, started taking rides last summer. And learn the history about it. It's absolutely a beautiful ride, and of course it's, it's joining us here for this interview today, and people can see it themselves uh, Monday through Friday and the weekends, yep. 4 to midnight. Um, most people make reservations in advance, but you also accept walk-ons, yeah, right? Yeah, we, we mostly go by reservations, and whenever I am available and here without any reservations, I'll take walk-up rides. Great. Well, thank you very much, Casey Clayton, gondolier, for an enjoyable conversation about Gondola Romantica and an absolutely gorgeous evening right here in Centennial Lakes with a beautiful ride for a romantic evening. To learn more, check out the website. And for dates and times and costs, enjoy the ride next time you come. We're sitting in the amphitheater for this broadcast at Centennial Lakes Park, and it's a beautiful venue if you like music and if you would like to listen to the first John Philip Sousa Memorial Band, yes. you'll enjoy hearing from the conductor, Scott Crosby. Thanks for joining us on In a Dining. My pleasure. The first John Philip Sousa Memorial Band. Actually, not the second. That's right, not, not the, the third. third. Yeah. But a registered name, too, with John Philip Sousa's family. Yes, when we adapted the name, we called out to John Philip Sousa III in Manhattan, and he was a real estate investor at the time, and we asked him if we could use his great-grandfather's name on our band, and he said, absolutely. So and for we those, did. And for those young folks who don't realize the importance of John Philip Sousa? Yeah. Yeah, that's a name. That's a name. That's a serious name. He, was, he had the popularity of the Beatles in his day. When he tried, did his round the world tour, he got to Johannesburg, South Africa, and I'm not kidding you, 35,000 people came to meet him at the train station. Well, you don't get that news. many people coming to watch your group play, but you more than twice packed the venue here. It seats a thousand. It seats a thousand. You had almost 3,000 here that line the park. To yeah, watch we your we group pack come. them in over the bank and around here and behind us. You can see there's some green. They sit there, and we uh, we pack them in and have fun. Now, how did this get started? This goes back this, to 1970. 1970. Myself and a bunch of friends from the high school band over at Edina High School graduated and said, you know, this was too much fun to let go. So we went to Buffalo High School with $150 and bought 50 band uniforms for $3 a piece, went down to Growth Music and got a bunch of marches for $3 a piece, and we had a band. We called it the Band on Wheels. We'd get in our uniforms, get in our cars, and drive to a community unannounced, form up in the street, do a parade, go to the park, get a crowd, play a concert, get back in our cars and leave, and everybody was blaming everybody else for getting <laughs> us there. Nobody knew where we came from. And that's a road show. Yeah, we were an attack band. And you settled down right here in the city. And we settled down here in the city. What a great, what a great opportunity for yeah, the oh, citizens. Yeah, it was fun. And, and, you know, it's a great opportunity for us, too. I mean, the city has been great to us. The Park and Rec is so cooperative. Anything we want, we get. And, and the city fathers have always been so 
uh, supportive of us. Uh, it's just a great situation. You have 40 musicians. Yes. And they are not paid a dime. No, nobody's paid a dime. Um, I don't take anything. Uh, we all do it because it's a labor of love, and mm -hmm. we love to do it. Mm -hmm. And I know that sounds a little corny to some folks, but really, if, if you enjoy music, whether you're on the listening end or the playing end, mm -hmm. and especially live music, so a yeah. place like this has got to be dynamite. Oh, to it's in. dynamite. It's dynamite. This is a wonderful place to play. And we've got a great following. They're, they're real loyal, and they... They know most of our names by now, and if one of the guys is missing for whatever reason, they'll come up and say, you know, where was Jeremy? And, you know, so it's... it's, it's <laughs> they it's, really get to know yeah, the band. Yeah, we're all part of a big family. But see, th what, what's interesting that you say that is they get to know the band because you're a crowd-pleasing group. Yes. We, so tell, talk about that a little well, bit. It's not stiff like some marching no, band no, you see no. on and, fields. And some, this is different. Some band concerts when they say, and now we're going to play, and they play something, and boom, boom, everybody's in, and, and next written, and so on, so... We don't do that. We try to break down any barriers that exist between the band and the audience and just make it a, uh, an, an open door where the, where the vibes and the fun just go through. And so the kind of music we're going to hear. Yeah, right. Uh, Tell well, us about it's, it. It's, it's, you know, at the turn of the century, uh, the, the fidelity that everybody heard uh, was poor. I mean, you had the pump organ at church. You had the church choir, which was considerably better. Uh, you, maybe you had a wax cylinder phonograph yeah. uh, and the piano, but you, you didn't have big fidelity. And the only place you got that was the town band. Yeah. And there you had the big bass and the big drums and the big clarinet sound and the trumpets. And so the town band was a popular thing to go listen to. And as a result of that, a lot of popular music was written in the turn of the century because that was the vehicle. And we've got a lot of that stuff, old rags, old marches, but we have things that are, that are newer too. Uh, uh, there's show tunes and features and that kind of thing, but we make sure that it's all crowd-pleasing stuff, mm -hmm. something with a, a real catchy melody or rhythms that are pleasing to hear and exciting and fun for the band to play and fun to listen to. And, and when we stick to that, they come. Yeah, and, and you fill the house, and you play in a lot of houses around town, too. Yeah, we do about 11 concerts in the summer throughout the metropolitan area. So you're rotating all the time. Right, we're rotating all the time. And you can be selective about where you play, too. Oh, and we are. We are. Group, we, sure. and, and good venues and mm -hmm. good receptions. I mean, we've kind of weeded out the, the communities that, you know, don't really get into it or have just a very poor facility because yeah. that's my musician's payment is is a good crowd and a good place to play that's that's what that's what we go for and the range of instruments you've got yeah you've it's, got it all. it's a concert band yeah. you know it's the full complement It's percussion uh, tubas trombones baritones euphoniums saxophone section flutes clarinets uh, woodwinds, uh, the whole thing. You probably so. get people dancing right here. Outside. Oh yeah, I'm, I'm getting moved <laughs> myself. I'm starting to get worked up. Don't go up. away just okay. yet. We want to hear about the shows that are coming up this okay. fall. Okay, okay, great. Us about uh, those. Uh, well, this is our the Torchlight concert is our last uh, show of the the season in the summer, okay. and we have a show that we do at Red Wing, Minnesota, the last Saturday of September. Uh, we pack that house too every year. It sells out. And the following day, the following night, we start at Edinburgh Park across the street here uh, in the amphitheater, and we're there the last Sunday of every month with a different concert. Great. So we rehearse Sunday nights. We've got three rehearsals to put together a completely new show, and we bring it up there, and, and that's fun, too. We give away peanuts and... and uh, <laughs> And programs and a and, good time and a good time, a great, great time. Yeah, conductor Scott Crosby, thank you so much for thank, all the work you do. Thirty-seven you. years 30, with this group. Yeah, but I started when I come. was five. <laughs> yeah, I'm sure. Thanks so much. Good playing, and we'll see you soon. Thank you. All Thanks right, for thank having you, me. You bet. Well, one of the oldest hobbies around is still alive and well right here in the city of Edina, and that's model building. But in particular, we're going to take a look at some model yachts, model boats, and they're remote controlled, and they actually are put right here in the lake, right here at Centennial Lakes. And joining us to talk about that, John Bishop, you're a member of the Edina Model Yacht Club. Thank you very much for joining us well, on In Edina. Thank you for the invitation. What a cool hobby. It's very interesting. This is really great. It started in 1991, right? Yeah, that's correct. Not the hobby building itself, but your club, no, Our club started in the uh, early 90s, and it was really um, a joint venture between some uh, personnel here at the, the city of Edina that, that saw this as a potential uh, for the community and then also some interested members that came down here. We saw the, the fantastic park being developed and we thought what a great place to run the boats. Yeah, and when we say run the boats, we're talking about we're talking about model boats that people build and then launch right here in the lake, right? Yes. 
Uh, exactly. And what we do is we actually, uh, we're a club that, uh, that is geared around electric, steam powered, and also the sailboats, which are strictly uh, wind powered. A lot of people see the sailboats on the, uh, on the water, but uh, they're just strictly wind powered, no propellers. Uh, or other devices to operate them. It's the real deal. Now, yeah. you, you obviously have a lot of people interested in this. You have more than 120 members. Yeah, it, it fluctuates from year to year, but there's uh, at least anywhere from 125 to 150 members that participate with the club each year. That's a lot of folks that are really interested in this, and I'll bet you have a great time launching some of these boats, all ages, I imagine. Yes, uh, the full spectrum. We have uh, young children. A lot of the, the younger uh, members are members along with their parents, and then we have uh, quite a few retired individuals as well. And, and I mentioned in the beginning that, you know, this is kind of an old-fashioned hobby, but it's still going on, and we're talking about um, building these actual pieces. Talk a little bit about some of the materials that are involved. Well, with the kits, uh, you, can, you can really go from uh, the full spectrum of uh, prefabricated, ready-to-run type boats where you just take, uh, you purchase the boats, you charge uh, the batteries, uh, put the boat in the water, it's ready to operate. And then there's... Uh, Folks who don't have a lot of time will want that. Exactly. And then uh, what we really have is uh, quite a few very skilled model builders. And then there's kits that really tailor to their needs as well. So you can you can run the full gamut of, uh, of involvement within the hobby. There are kits uh, such as this one that are very detailed. And it's uh, clearly a skill. It is. I mean, let's take a look at this one for a moment. This is a whaling boat, right? Yes, it's a copy of a 1920 uh, Japanese whaling vessel. And uh, this uh, particular kit is made by a company in uh, Japan, Sado. And it's uh, four feet long. And it's uh, a very accurate representation of the types of vessels that would have sailed uh, in, in the early 1900s. One of your longtime members built this yes. by hand, and you said it took him how long? Well, I believe it was uh, just under a year. It was from a kit, but it's a very detail-oriented kit. A lot of separate parts. It comes with blueprints, and so That's when you huge. look at the planking for the uh, the top deck, uh, a lot of those had to be individually cut and fabricated. Uh, mostly this is wood. The, the hull is fiberglass, but all of the painting here was done by hand and uh, quite an ornate, quite an involved project. Wow, huge. And this is really cool. It's got a little catwalk on it. We're going to show folks, this is unusual because it's not remote controlled, per se. Uh, this one is. Oh, it is remote it's controlled. It's fully remote controlled. But so. it's steam run. Uh, correct. And that's what makes it so unique. Exactly. And what we use is, uh, we'll use a transmitter to operate uh, the boat, so you could actually stand on the side um, along the shoreline, and then uh, via wireless control, you can actually operate the different functions of the boat. Well, then how does the steam power through this, this vessel? Uh, I'll show you here, I'm removing the catwalk for the boat, and it really uses steam as its uh, power source to operate uh, the radio control boat. Down in here, what we use as a fuel is uh, methanol, and methanol is a uh, highly refined form of uh, alcohol and the alcohol uh, is contained within the little uh, burner section. Uh, it creates a flame. Uh, this right here is the boiler. The boiler heats up uh, two cups of uh, distilled water, converts uh, that into steam. The steam runs through, picks up uh, some oil within the reservoir to help lubricate. This is a, a three-cylinder, double-acting uh, steam piston. And uh, the hot steam passes through, drives the uh, three cylinders uh, independently. There's a flywheel off the back end. It's connected to a union and through a uh, propeller shaft and uh, rotates and spins a, a three-bladed uh, brass propeller off the back How end. How fast can this thing go? Uh, it, it's about a quick walk, so I'd say about three to four <laughs> miles per hour. Wow. We'll go ahead and put it back together again while, while we continue talking about it. What a cool operation. You know, I'm just thinking, what a learning tool. Uh, it's excellent. It's, uh, it's a good reference to, to our history and what was, uh, how boats uh, really helped influence uh, the way business was done and how things progressed. And, uh, how it changed our economy, our absolutely. society, over time, how engines work. I can really see where young folks would really enjoy the hands-on learning you get with this oh, it's fantastic. and the fun. Yeah, excellent. And you have a big event the end of every summer. Yes. And that's the, the Lighthouse. Lighthouse Night. It was actually started in the mid-90s. It was one of our club members, uh, Jeff McCabe, who on a uh, family vacation toured around uh, Lake Michigan, saw a lighthouse that he liked. Uh, uh, 
took some photos, came back home, and uh, built and hence up. It's uh, here. It's here, and uh, we use that as a backdrop for our event. How many boats uh, and vessels do you get in the water then for that? Uh, usually 40 to 50 run wow. uh, during that uh, event. That's great. If folks want to get involved in your group, how do they do it? <clears throat> they can reference uh, uh, our website, the uh, Edina Model Yacht Club. Uh, it's emyc.org. Or they can, uh, they can come out any night we run. We run informally Tuesdays, Thursdays, and Sunday evenings, typically after right. dinner. John, thanks so much for bringing this. What a great, great time this is. Oh, you're welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Appreciate it. Well, I hope you have an opportunity to come out here to Centennial Lakes Park and enjoy one of the many activities we shared with you. I'd like to thank all our guests for talking about the activities, be they athletics, events, entertainment, or just good fun right here around the park year round. Thank you very much to the Centennial Lakes Park manager for letting us record this program here. You've been watching In Edina. I'm your host, Lillian McDonald. Until next time, have a great day. Mm -hmm.